Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. Today I'm going to be reading chapter 3 of How to Train Your Dragon, which is called Heroes or Exiles. The boys scrambled over the slimy pebbles at the edge of the beach and back up to Madman's Gully, the gorge they had climbed through a couple of hours before. This was a narrow crack in the cliffs filled with large rocks. They tried to move as quickly as they could, but this is difficult when you're slipping and sliding over huge stones covered in ice and they made painfully slow progress. A dragon that hadn't been put off by the snow came shrieking down into the gorge. He landed on Warty Hog's back and started savaging him, sinking his fangs into Warty Hog's shoulder and ripping red lines into his arms. Gobba bashed the dragon on the nose with the handle of his axe and the dragon let go and flapped away. But a whole wave of dragons replaced him, pouring into the canyon with awful rasping cries. Fire shooting from their nostrils and melting the snow before them, talons spread wickedly as they swooped downwards. Gobba stood, legs wide apart, and whirled his big double-headed axe. He threw back his great hairy head and yelled a terrible primeval yell that echoed down the sides of the gorge and made the hairs on the back of Hiccup's neck stick straight up like the spines on a sea urchin. There's a fantastic illustration here for the dragon swooping down. Individually, dragons tend to have a healthy sense of self-preservation, but they are braver when they hunt in packs. They knew now that they had the advantage of massive numbers, so they didn't check their flying for an instant. They just kept on coming. Gobba let go of the axe. Spinning end to end, the axe soared up through the softly falling snow. It hit the biggest dragon of the lot, killing him instantly, and then carried on going, landed in a snowdrift hundreds of feet away and disappearing. This made the rest of the dragons think a bit. Some of them scrambled over each other in their haste to fly away, yelping like dogs. The others came to a halt, hovering uncertainly, screaming defiance but keeping their distance. Waste of a good axe, grunted Gobba. Keep going, boys, they could come back. Hiccup needed no encouragement to keep going. As soon as he got out of the gorge and onto the marshy land behind it, he broke into a stumbling run, every now and then falling flat on his face in the snow. Some time later, when Gobba reckoned they were safe distance from the wild dragon cliff, he yelled at the boys to stop. Very carefully, he counted heads again to check he hadn't lost anybody. Gobba had spent an unpleasant ten minutes standing at the mouth of the dragon's cave, wondering why there was such a terrible racket and what he was going to stay, say to Stoic the Vast if he lost his precious son and heir for good. Something tactful and sensitive, he supposed. But tact and sensitivity were not Gobba's strong points and he took the first five minutes to come up with Hiccup copped it, sorry, and then spent the second five minutes tearing his beard out. Consequently, although secretly mightily relieved, he was not in a good mood and as soon as he could get his breath back he exploded all over the place as the boys stood shivering violently in a bedraggled line. Never in 14 years have I come across such a load of hopeless barnacles as you lot. Which of you useless mollusks was responsible for waking up the dragons? I was, said Hiccup, which wasn't strictly true. Oh, that's brilliant, bellowed Gobba. Just brilliant. Our future leader shows off his magnificent leadership skills. At the tender age of ten and a half, he does his best to annihilate himself and the rest of you in a simple military exercise. Snotlout sniggered. You find something amusing about that snotlout? asked Gobba, with a dangerous softness. Everybody is on limpet rations for the next three weeks. The boys groaned. Ugh. Smart work, Hiccup, sneered Snoplout. I can't wait to see you in action on the battlefield. Silence, yelled Gobba. This is your initiation, not a day out in the country. Silence or you'll be lunching on Lugwell for the rest of your lives. Now, continued Gobba more calmly, although that was an absolute mess, I, it wasn't a total disaster. 
I presume that you all have a dragon after that fiasco. Yes, chorused the boys. Fishlegs looked sideways at Hiccup, who was staring straight ahead. Lucky for you, said Gobber ominously. So you will have all passed the first part of the dragon test. There are, however, still two parts that you have to complete before you can become full members of the tribe. Your next task will be to train this dragon yourself. This will be a test of the force of your personality. You will assert your will over this wild creature and show it to his master. Your dragon will be expected to obey simple commands such as go and stay and hunt fish for you in the way that dragons have hunted for the sons of Thor since anybody can remember. If you are worried about the training process, you should study a book called How to Train Your Dragon by Professor Yobbish, which you will find in the fireplace of the Great Hall. Suddenly, Gobba looked very pleased with himself. I stole that book from the Meathead Public Library myself, he said modestly, regarding his very black fingernails. From right under the nose of the hairy, scary librarian, he never noticed a thing. Now that's burglary for you. Warty Hog put up his hand. What happens if we can't read, sir? No boasting, Warty Hog boomed Gobba. Get some idiot to read it for you. Your dragons will begin to go back to sleep because this is still their hibernation time. Some of the dragons had indeed gone very quiet inside the baskets. So take them home and put them in a warm place. They should wake up in the next couple of weeks. You will then have only four months to prepare for initiation day at the Thor's Day Thursday celebrations and the final part of your test. If on that day you can prove that you have trained your dragon to the satisfaction of myself and the other elders of the tribe, you can finally call yourself a hooligan of Burke. The boy stood very tall and tried to look like proper hooligans. Heroes or exile, yelled Gobber the Belch. Heroes or exile, yelled eight boys fanatically back at him. Exile, thought Hiccup and Fishleg sadly. Oh, I hate being oh, a Viking, panted Fishlegs to Hiccup as they stumbled back through the bracken to the hooligan village. You didn't really walk to the island of Burke, you waded through heather or bracken or mud or snow that clung onto your legs and made them difficult to lift. It was the sort of country where the sea and the land were always falling into one another, getting mixed up. The island was shot through with holes burrowed by the water, a maze of crisscrossing underground streams. You could put your foot on a solid looking piece of grass and find yourself disappearing up to your thigh in black, sticky mud. You could be making your way through the ferns and suddenly find yourself fording a river, waist high and icy cold. The boys were already soaked to the skin with seawater and now the snow had turned to horizontal driving rain, blowing in their faces with the strength of one and the, with the strength of one of the gale force winds that were always shrieking across the salty wastelands of Burke. A narrow escape from horrible death first thing on a Thursday morning, complained Fishlegs followed by a complete rejection by the junior half of the tribe. Nobody's going to talk for me for years after this, except for you, Hiccup. But then you're just a weirdo like me. Thank you, said Hiccup. And on top of everything, continued Fishlegs bitterly, a two-mile run carrying a deranged dragon on my back. The basket on Fishlegs' back was plunging wildly from side to side as the dragon inside tried manically to get out. There's an illustration there of fish legs with the dragon pulling in a different direction. And only a dinner of horrible limpets to look forward to at the end of it. Hiccup agreed that it wasn't a delicious prospect. You can have this dragon back if you like, Hiccup. I warn you, they're filthy heavy when they're wet and cross, said fish legs miserably. Gobber is going to go off like a typhoon when he finds out you haven't got a dragon. But I have got one, said Hiccup. Fishlegs stopped and began to take the basket off his back. Oh, I know it is really your dragon, he said wearily. I think I'll just go straight past the village and keep on running till I reach somewhere civilised. Rome, perhaps. I've always wanted to go to Rome. And I haven't got a hope in Valhalla of passing initiation anyway, so...
No, I've got another one. In my basket, Hip Hiccup insisted. Fishleg's jaw, jaw dropped it open in disbelief. I got it when we went back into the tunnel, explained Hiccup. Well, blister my barnacle, said Fishlegs. How in Thor's name did you know it was there? It was so dark you couldn't see the horns in front of you. It was weird, said Hiccup. I sort of sensed it when we were running down the tunnel. I couldn't see anything, but as we were passing, I just knew there was a dragon there. And that it was meant to be my dragon. I was going to ignore it, actually, because we were in a bit of a hurry. But then you said about not having a dragon, and I went back and there it was, lying on this shelf in the tunnel, just as I'd imagined it would be. Well, jigger my jellyfish, said Fishlegs, and he, the boy started running again. Hiccup was bruised all over, shaking from shock, and he had a nasty dragon wound on his calf, which was stinging like crazy from the salt water. He was freezing cold, and there was an irritating bit of seaweed in one of his sandals. He was also a bit worried, because he knew he would not have risked his life trying to get a dragon for fish legs. This was not the act of a Viking hero. A Viking hero would have known not to intervene between fish legs and his fate. On the other hand, Hiccup had been worrying about Dragon Catching Day for longer than he could remember. He had been sure he would be the only one to come back without a dragon. And shame, embarrassment and awful exile would follow. And now, here he was, a Viking warrior with a dragon. So on the whole, he was feeling fairly pleased with himself. Things were looking up. You know, Hiccup, said Fishlegs a little later, as the wooden fortifications of the village appeared on the horizon. That sounds like fate. You sensing the dragon was there like that? This could be meant to be. You sh could have some sort of wonder dragon in there, something that makes a monstrous nightmare look like a flying frog. You are the son and heir of Chief Stoic, after all, and about time fate came in with a sign about your destiny. The boy stopped, puffing with exhaustion. Oh, I'm sure it's just a common or garden that wandered away from the rest, said Hiccup, trying to sound careless, but unable to keep the excitement out of his voice. He could have something marvellous in there. Maybe Old Wrinkly was right. Old Wrinkly was Hiccup's grandfather and mother on his side. He had taken up soothsaying in his old age and kept on telling Hiccup how he, was looked, how he had looked into the future and that Hiccup was destined for great things. This amazing dragon could be the beginning of his transformation from ordinary old Hiccup, who wasn't particularly good at anything, into a hero of the future. Hiccup took the basket off his back and paused before opening it. It's very still, isn't it? said Fishlegs, suddenly less certain of the fate theory. I mean, it isn't moving at all in there. Are you sure it's alive? It's just very deeply asleep, said Hiccup. It was stone cold when I picked it up. Suddenly, he had a strong feeling that the gods were on his side. He knew that his dragon was alive. With trembling fingers, Hiccup undid the latch, took off the lid of the basket and peered in. Fishleg joined him. Things weren't looking so good anymore. There, curled up fast asleep in the bottom of the basket, in a tangled dragon knot, lay perhaps the most common or garden common or garden dragon Hiccup had ever seen. There's an illustration here of what it looked like in the bottom of the basket. Absolutely, the only extraordinary thing about this dragon was how extraordinarily small it was. In this, it was truly extraordinary. Most dragons that the Vikings used for hunting purposes were about the size of a Labrador dog. The adolescent dragons the boys were collecting weren't quite that big, but were nearly full grown. This dragon was more comparable to a West Highland Terrier. That's a very small dog. Hiccup couldn't think how he had overlooked this when he picked up the dragon in the tunnel. He supposed miserably that it was rather a pressured moment, what with 3,000 dragons trying to kill him at that time. And the dragons in deep sleep coma do tend to weigh more when they do when they're awake. Well, said Hiccup at last, that's a sign if you like. 
You reach for a deadly nadder and what do you get? A basic brown. I grab a dragon in the dark and what do I get? A common or garden. The thing is, the gods are telling us we're common or garden folk fish legs. You and I, we're not meant to be heroes. It doesn't matter about me, said fish legs. But you are meant to be a hero, remember? Son of the chief and all that. And you will be one. I know you will. Fishlegs put the basket back on Hiccup's back and they trudged towards the village gates together. At least, I sincerely hope you will. I don't want to be following Snotlout into battle. You've got more ideas about military tactics in your little finger than Snotlout has in his whole fat head. While that may have been true, not only was Hiccup not about to be the future star of dragon training, but with this particular dragon, it was even going to be difficult for him to take his familiar place fading into the background. It was so small, it was going to make him look ridiculous. It was so small that Snotlout was going to have some very unpleasant things to say about it. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of How to Train Your Dragon, and I'll see you soon for another one. Bye!